you know, last night I, we had we we're kind of short time, so I didn't really introduce myself very well or very much. Uh, my name's Bill Hackworth. My wife, I think, is eating, uh, but her name is Angela. Uh, we we the Lord spoke to me in December of 2010 and said, "Get a church." And so I argued with him for a little bit, uh, and you know how that works out. Uh, and so we got a church, hallelujah. And uh, we, we got a little country church. We stayed there for a couple years, and the Lord opened a door for us right in the middle of our county seat to give us a church debt-free, vans debt-free, uh, everything just handed to us debt-free. And so we took that. We've been there for eight years. Uh, we were one of the first churches to pioneer the, the finish work message in our community, and everybody loved it. Everybody just accepted us. No, I'm lying. <laughs> it went over like a pork chop in the synagogue. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the thing is, is we kept, there was times I wanted to quit, I'll be honest. There was times that it was like, is this even worth it anymore? Like, like when, we were fit, when, when I first came into ministry, uh, my pastor is really big on, and still is today, on signs, wonders, miracles, healings. And so that was kind of, that was kind of our MO. We came into it through that. And, and the persecution that came with just the pure gospel that Je- Jesus, you know, bringing it back to the center of who Christ is, uh, it was, it, 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 it boggled my mind the offense that it brought up in people in our community. And we're a very small community. Uh, our whole county is 28,000 people. Our school, our high school is a rural high school where all the different towns come to one high school. So you almost, it's not just knowing the people in your town. You kind of know everybody in the whole county that you live in. And uh, I kind of got a reputation. And they didn't know how to define me because I, because I believe because of the finished work we can live holy. I don't, I don't, I, not, not when we were trying to press into it, but if our sin nature's gone, right, then, then there's no, and, and, and we're now uh, partakers of his divine nature, uh, there's no reason why we can't walk this thing out, right? You, there, before Jesus, we, it was impossible. That's what Jesus was trying to uh, you know, bring to us. He wasn't preaching grace. He was preaching law. He was preaching law on steroids. It's just not what you do, but it's what you think. And if you can't do it, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, right? If you can't live up to it, it, it this is the best way to do it, or you can believe in me. And, and so... Uh, we came out of persecution. I wanted to quit time and time again. I wanted to walk away. And some of you might know Cecil Hall. He got the revelation, and he'd been a pastor for, I think he's been pastoring for 30 years, and he kind of came alongside me. And so we were the only, we had the big grace growth in our churches where everybody left, and uh, we had to almost start all over again. But, you know, honestly, if I hadn't come into the finished work, I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, man, I just battled with, I shared with you last night, I battled with insecurity uh, you know, my, my wife and I had a, a radical encounter with Jesus on a Sunday. Uh, I'll just back up a minute, and I'll get into my sermon. My wife and I uh, both come from dysfunctional families. Uh, got, our first son was born when we were 18. We got married when we were 18. We just celebrated 25 years in February. Uh, we suffered for Jesus in Belize. Uh, hallelujah. And... Uh, 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 but my aunt, my, you, I had this crazy aunt that uh, always talking about Jesus, always I'm praying for you and all these things. And she came over one Sunday or one Saturday night and there was a, there was an evangelist from, uh, Malawi, Malawi, Africa at a church. And she's like, you got to come here. And then she threatened to take me out of her will. And I was like, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, and she's still alive. So I haven't gotten it. No, <laughs> uh, but, uh. But we went in, and I'm going to tell you, uh, he preached for three hours. I'm not exaggerating. I was sitting by the clock. And when you're not a Christian, three hours of preaching, you're just, I'm watching the clock going, is this guy for real? And I didn't understand anything he was saying. I mean, he could speak English, but it was, had a lot of, you know, an accent in it. And so I couldn't understand half of what he was saying. And he was preaching, so I didn't, you know, I didn't really care about what he was saying. I just wanted to get out of there. I had I, made the decision that I believe in God, but I don't know about Jesus. Uh, and so I had, you know... I was just there to get my inheritance. Uh, then I found out my aunt's broke. Hallelujah. She, she hoodwinked me. Uh, but at the end of that service, I never went up for prayer. I, never, I, I, I was mad at God. I was mad at the world. I just carried this chip on my shoulder. At the end of that service, uh, I, we stood up. Just, you know, they were going to do the dismissal prayer. And, man, I felt the presence of God. I, ne- I never felt. I've been in, I grew up in Pentecostal circles, okay? And, and it was the Pentecostal church that actually pushed me out of church. Uh, I got offended uh, because of legalism. And I said, I'll, I'll never go back. I'll never step foot in church again. Uh, 
But but I felt the presence of God come over me. And literally, I, I don't know how to say it, but that chip on my shoulder felt like this tangible, real thing. It, it, it was almost like a spiritual thing that had attached itself to me. But when, let me say this. When you're 18 years old and you have your first son, not everybody takes you seriously. And so this chip on my shoulder actually is what pushed me through uh, to, to be able to get jobs to, to support my family. And and I felt the Lord begin to pull this thing off of me in, in the middle of a service, not asking for anything, not needing anything, just or not feeling like I needed anything. Uh, and I, and I, honestly, I felt like I, I can't let that go. This is what's carried me through life. And the presence of God got so strong on me, I just closed my eyes, prayed for the first time in probably 10 years, and I said, Lord, if this is you, if you take me, you've got to take my wife also. You've got to take Angela. Something supernatural happened immediately. I, I, I was immediately changed. I was freaked out changed. Uh, and good church people come up and they're hugging us. They say, hey, you guys got to come back. And I'm trying to get out of this place because something actually took place in my life that second uh, that I've never been the same ever, ever before. Walk outside, look at Angela, and I'm getting ready to tell her, like, hey, something just happened to me. And she looks at me and she goes, well, I don't know what just happened. I'm changed. And so we went home that night, and we were like a couple teenage kids up to like 3 o'clock in the morning just going back and forth going, this is real. This is real. Jesus is real. And that was my message for the first couple of years is Jesus is real because I honestly didn't believe that he was real. I, I didn't believe. I started watching Discovery Channel, you know, and it, there's a lot of good biblical information on there. not. But uh, And so I started, I started thinking, you know, man, they've – the whole Christian faith is hoodwinked all of us. And so, uh, and then I had this encounter with Jesus. I've never been the same. Uh, we, the location we're at now, we've been there for eight years. It's been amazing. You know, I've been in every season you can be. I've been dry. I've been in the valley. I've wanted to quit. I've been on fire. Uh, but, you know, I, I look back now, like we have, we have people on our worship team that were, that came to us when they're 16, 17, they're 23, 24 now. I had kids. I have, I have a, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids that call me dad because they didn't have dads in our life and I think you know what if if not if we don't accomplish anything else uh that we were able to be that for the, for the people that didn't have it and I mean I have a I have a, a one of my daughters who's in uh the military right now and she calls me probably once or twice uh a month and just lets me know where she's at and it, when she came to our church she was 12 years old her and her mom was the first person now she's 22 she's doing awesome and so it's been, a, it's been an amazing ride. We have two sons, uh, Connor's 25 and Dylan's 23. And uh, Connor's actually married, and he lives behind me. Hallelujah. He loves living by his parents. Uh, he's looking to buy a house as far away as he can from us. But, uh, uh, and we're looking forward to grandbabies. So we're, we're kind of trying to live life up as much as we can right now. You know, when, when, when you have a kid when you're 18, you don't do anything but just go to work, go home, eat ramen noodle soup, go to work, go home, eat ramen noodle soup. Uh, I've had every flavor of ramen noodle soup known to mankind, hallelujah. <laughs> every different seasoning you can put in ramen noodle soup with some hot dogs, we've did it. Uh, and so we actually we're in our early 40s, and we're able to just kind of we just enjoy life more than ever before and enjoy it because of our relationship with Christ, our relationship with the body of Christ, uh, knowing that he's always for us. I, here's what I can say about my, my journey with Jesus is he's always faithful, right? Even when it seems like I've been in seasons, it's been like, where are you at? Where are you at in this season? And I go a year or two years down the road, and I look back, and I realize even though I didn't feel him, even though I didn't experience him, and even though I didn't know that he was working, he was working in me, maturing me and growing me uh, to the person I am today. So uh, just a little history uh, of who we are, where we come from. We live in Pineville, Missouri. If you're not familiar where that's at, uh, a lot of people know Joplin because of the tornado we had in 2011. Uh, but we are, if you're not familiar with Joplin, if you're familiar with Walmart, we live about 20 minutes north of Walmart headquarters. Hallelujah. And if you ever go down there, go down to Walt's dime, five, or is it nickel a dime, five and dime something. It's the original Walmart that was ever built. They still got it in there. They still have his truck in there, his office is in there. Uh, it's a big deal where we're at. So let me just open up with prayer here, and then we'll get into this. Father, we thank you, hallelujah, we thank you that you're good. You're always, you're always, you're always good, hallelujah. Even though we don't know, even though we can't see at times, even though we don't understand, uh, we have to rely on, if we miss that you're good, we miss all of it, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. All right, this year's been a rough year for me, I'll be honest with you, my... 
besides the coronavirus and everything, I, I you know, I lost my, I lost, I, I say my pastor, but she was my spiritual mother, and she was more than her spiritual mother. I shared with you last night that my, my family put the phone in dysfunction, and so uh, Angela and I didn't have uh, quality parents, and so when we, when we come under the leadership of our pastors they didn't just become our pastor became our mom and dad and i lost my i lost my pastor to her about or she lost the battle or whatever one and however you want to say to cancer and uh in the middle of that uh, me and her, her husband my pastor's name's rocky and her name is bridget uh me and him and her in the in in her bedroom together and she was not uh conscious and i'll be honest with you i was getting angry at god because we have prayed i never prayed that much in my life i i prayed constantly I was in there praying over her praying for cancer to die praying for her to live and uh, I look at my pastor and I said uh, my, my pastor's the healing I've seen tons of healing seen people with cancer heal seen people just crazy stuff happen and this is where I started out in ministry and and I'm frustrated I'm I'm expecting her to get up and walk out of that bed and uh, I look at him and I said I said if she doesn't live I said how you not get mad at God and he looked at me and he says, how can I get mad at God? I said, uh, because he, she's not living. And he says, yeah, he says, but God's good. And he says, and no matter what happens in this situation, he says, I don't know everything. He says, God's good. And he left the room and I'm still mad. Like, uh, uh, my, my pastor's got like this. He always says, let it roll off your back like water off a duck's back. And I always think that's good. But I'm not always there. I'm still sometimes, you know, want to give people the five fingers of faith. And he's still, uh, he's more like Jeremiah. Just love everybody. <laughs> but uh, he came back in there like a minute later. It's like it got to him. And he says, I want to tell you something. He says, I don't care what happens with this. He says, but when, you know, if she lives, if she goes on to be with the Lord, he says, you can't stop what you're doing. You got to keep moving. He says, you take your, take your season or you need to be angry at God. Take that season. He says, then move on. He says, and you're going to have to go on. You got to understand that God's good. And, uh, I was angry for about two weeks. I'll just be straight with you. I was, just, I was like, I, I didn't understand it. Uh, and I know it's not God. God doesn't have to explain it to me, but I, was, I, I demanded it. Uh, but it, honestly, it transformed me. I just, to see, I don't know if I could sit there with my wife. You know, they'd been married for, I think, 50-some years. I don't know if I could sit there with my wife of 50 years and we'll watch her pass away and still say God's good. And when he did that, I said, it just transformed me. And I thought, you know what, no matter what comes, the fear of death has been taken away because we've been guaranteed eternal life. So here we go. I'll jump into this. Uh, you know, last night I finished up with a scripture from John fourteen thirteen. It says, "Whatever you ask in my name, that I w whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father will be glorified in the Son." And I finished up saying this: "Is I I have no problem praying in the name of Jesus. I do it all the time. But but I don't know that Jesus was actually saying to add in the name of Jesus at the end of our prayer. But I believe He was actually saying to pray in our identity, pray out of who you are in Christ. And He says, "Then whatever you ask." Whatever you ask will be given to you, right? That's offensive to some of us because that means that if I ask for a boat, hallelujah. But hold on a second. Let me go on. Are you guys, uh, is anybody here familiar with like Kenneth Hagin and the Word of Faith days? Yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of what I've come out of. And when I first got into grace, I was kind of like what Jeremiah said. I, I, I was mad at everything, you know. I actually went in to preach grace literally just to make people mad. I said things, just intentions of making people mad because I was angry because I'd been lied to for so many years. Uh, and I kind of tuned off anything. I tuned off signs, wonders, miracles. I, I tuned out Kenneth. I turned out the Word of Faith and all these things. But if you're familiar with him, this scripture here, will be familiar to you because it was the it was the center of what the word of faith was made out of and it starts in mark chapter 11 verses 22 through 25 and so so jesus answered and said to them have faith in god for surely i say to you whoever says to this mountain be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but said but believes that those things that he says will be done he'll have whatever he says therefore i say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them and so let me do one more real quick because because there is a truth there's a pre-cross and there's a post-cross uh did I read the last? Oh, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have any, anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. That was used to scare the 
dickens out of me because I always thought that if, if, it was, if my salvation was based on my ability to forgive people, I'm going to hell, amen? Yeah, because I, I, I might, I, I, there's some people I had a hard time forgiving, but, but we know that was, that was pre-cross, or that was before the cross. After the cross, Paul says that forgive as you've been forgiven, right? Hey, the only way I can forgive you is if I can receive forgive. I can't give away what I've had first have, right? And so the only way I'm going to forgive you is if I first can receive forgiveness. The, you can, it's like the commandment to love God with all your heart. You couldn't love God because you were commanded to any day of your life. That would be like me telling you to love that chair. You're going to go to hell, right? You, you could try, but you couldn't do it. But we only love him because he first loved us, right? So when we receive the love, we reciprocate that love, and it actually comes into us and it flows out of us. Amen? And then this is how we begin to love everybody. And then if we begin to hold ourselves to a, a higher standard, sometimes we've got to realize that, that that standard that we hold ourselves, God doesn't even hold ourselves up above other people. God doesn't even hold us to the same standard that we hold others to. Amen? So let me, but, but John also writes in the epistle, he says, and this is 1 John five fourteen through 15, he says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And so sometimes we want to qualify that whatever we ask from the Father, uh, is all, he only gives us what's of his will. So, so it would be important for us to know what his will is, right? And I could use tons of scriptures, but I'm, I'm just going to use three today, okay? Okay. Uh, Second Corinthians 8, 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though that he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Hallelujah. Let me say this. God does not have a problem with money. God doesn't have a problem with you having money. God has a problem with money having you, right? We should be at a place in our walk, and I'm not saying that I've arrived yet, but if we could get a billion dollars tomorrow, we should be able to gladly hand the billion dollars off because we realize the billion dollars is not our source, that the Father is our source, and if we hand it off, He can continue to bless us with or without it, right? God doesn't have a problem with you having money. He has a problem with money having you. Peter writes this in Peter 2.24. He says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So there's two. The first one is, I believe that that the will of the Father is that we're blessed financially, that we have financial blessings. We have money in the bank account, right? That if we want to go to Myrtle Beach and hang out with a bunch of grace, glory munchkins, that we can jump in the car and we can go. Or in a plane. I went first class, first time in my life on the way to Myrtle Beach. Uh, Thank God for the... No, I shouldn't say that. But... Because of the coronavirus, <laughs> uh, the prices went down enough that I finally just went ahead and bit the bullet and paid for first class. It was amazing. I, 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 don't, have a, I don't think the father has a problem with me as his son taking first class. Amen? The second thing is, is by his strength. So I believe the father wants you to be financially blessed. I believe the father wants you to have physical healing, right? Emotional healing. As I go, let me just, I'm going I'm to read a scripture to you real quick and I'll move on. Uh, Ephesians 2 8 says this For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Now, how we read salvation in the church today is I got my golden ticket, right? I get to go to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory where the schnozberries taste like schnozberries. We got the, the, the river, the chocolate river flowing all the time. But salvation in of itself, it, it is about going to heaven, but, it's, but that's not the, the, the salvation in, in of itself is that we became whole. We become, the word means that we are whole, we're preserved, we, 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 the fullness of everything that God has for us becomes part of us. So what, here's how I like to say it. Uh, I, I like to say that you were saved, right? You are saved, and you're continually being saved. And I know because of the work of the cross, that I'm not taking it out of the context of the work of the cross. I know that we were made perfect and whole uh, in one split second, but, so, but we, as we work out our salvation, as we grow and we mature, we begin to experience things and things begin begin to become different to us and we become whole, right? My, 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 I have the mind of Christ, but I don't always have his thoughts, his emotions, and his feelings. I, as I mature, his thoughts, his emotions, and my, his feelings become my thoughts, my emotions, and my feelings. Amen? So we are saved by grace, right? Uh, we're made whole by grace through faith. 
says, but that's not of your own, okay? Now, there's been different arguments. Some people say, well, he's talking about the grace. Your salvation is not of your own. And some people say, well, it's faith. He says, you've been saved by grace through faith. That's not of your own. Okay, I, I can take it either way, right? It was Jesus' faith that led him to the cross. It was Jesus' faith that led him to be uh, uh, crucified. It was his faith that he was buried in the tomb for three days, and it was his faith that he was resurrected. And my faith is only receiving what he finished. Okay, I'm going to talk to you a little about faith today. And, 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 and when we were in the, with the faith movement, what we thought was, or what we were taught was, was that if, if, uh, that my faith actually created reality, right? Like, like, I wasn't healed yet, but if I got enough faith built up, that God would heal me, right? And then if I didn't see my healing, it's because I didn't have enough faith. Well, in the finished work, in the context of the finished work, faith doesn't create reality. Faith only receives what's already true. Right? Right? It receives what's already finished. You are you were healed. Peter, you know, Isaiah writes that by his stripes you are healed, and Peter sees that and he sees the cross and he says, No, no, no. By your by his stripes you were healed. It's finished. By he has blessed us past tense with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Right? And what does my faith do? My faith just comes into agreement with that truth, right? And as and, and I do believe that there's processes. I, I I know that sometimes we don't like to hear this, but I, I just like my son when he was eight years old, I I would never hand him the keys to my truck because even though that everything that is mine is his, uh, he wasn't ready to drive it. I do believe we come to a place of maturity where as we mature and we grow in the Lord that he reveals and releases more stuff to us, right? Because he even told his disciples, uh, uh, what, what Mark was sharing last night was, is there's things that I would love to tell you right now, but you couldn't handle them, right? So there's things that maybe we're not quite ready for yet. And here's the, fun, the last thing I want to share in regards to God's will. God's will is that we are financially blessed. God's will that we're walking in divine healing. Uh, Romans fourteen seventeen says this, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I can, I can make a biblical argument that God wants us to be wealthy, healthy, living life. The word righteousness, it's, you know, uh, Andrew Walmack t- teaches us that righteous means my right to. I think the vines defines the vines defines it as how it ought to be right and so i can make a biblical argument today that god's will for my life is that i'm wealthy right and, and we like to we like to spiritualize everything god doesn't talk about money he's talking about your spiritual life i'm united with christ my spiritual life is very wealthy right even when maybe i'm i'm not feeling it it doesn't change the truth that uh this union that i have with jesus is like i'm basket he's closer to me than a siamese twin like he, we are we are grafted together right that we are wealthy, that we are healthy, and we're living life how it ought to be, with peace and joy and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I, I, I stopped saying Holy Ghost for a long time. I started saying Holy Spirit so I could be more technical, you know, uh, the modern times. And now I, go, I got back to saying Holy Ghost. I missed the, I, I always like drop my voice to Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> I think I, it might be the or the New King James says Holy Spirit, and so but you know the King James version always was Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. And I grew up in Pentecostal, and of course, uh, the King James version was Jesus's Bible, so that's all we ever listened to. Amen. Thus says the Lord. Uh, but I want to tackle this these scriptures, Mark eleven twenty two through twenty five backwards. Okay, because Jesus says this. He he, he says he, he, I don't know if you realize it, but he says three times, "What you say, what you say, what you say." If you believe and you do not doubt, you can have anything you want. And then right after that, he says, he says in verse twenty five, he says, "And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him." And I always thought that it's like he just jumped ship, but he didn't jump ship, right? Because I've come to this realization or this revelation or this illumination that what Jesus is trying to tell us is is that the whole kingdom has been given to us and the things that block us from receiving the fullness of the kingdom are things that are going on inside of us right and so he's telling you you can have what you speak is it important what we speak I know, I know the, I know the word of faith movement because I, I came out of that and I claim I was healed when I was sick because there's a fact that maybe I'm sick, but there's a truth that supersedes facts. And as long as I keep claiming that I'm healed, God's going to heal me. And, and, and if I one time said I'm sick, I just erased all that power, right? <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Some of the stuff we used to believe. 
But I do believe it's important what we say. Jesus says, out of the heart, or out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Jesus says here, what you say, what you say, what you say, what you uh, believe and do not doubt, you can have anything you want, right? And then he says, you got to forgive. And what, what the Lord started to put on my heart was this, is everything is to our access. We're not trying to gain anything from the Father. No, we're not trying to gain favor. We're not trying to gain material things. He, he has held nothing back from us. It's a good pleasure to give us his entire kingdom. That's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. It's his good, I say it all the time. It's his pleasure to give us the entire kingdom. And I think sometimes we're trying to get more of the kingdom, more of the kingdom. We're not trying to get it. We're just receiving what's already been given to us. But, but here's the thing is, is, let me say it this way. Have you, do you ever notice like if, if, and maybe I'm pick step on some toes in here, but like if you're a gossiper and you started a new job, it seems like maybe that all the gossipers end up in your circle, right? If you, if you, if you're always negative before the second day, you have found every negative person in the building and you are now feeding off each other's negative because what's going, the world inside of me is bigger than the world outside of me. And I draw to myself the very thing that's going on inside of me. And so I believe what Jesus is saying here is saying, look, if you've got bitterness in your heart, if you're holding on to offense, if you're holding on to unforgiveness, you're not going to receive everything that I have for you. Now, this might not be theologically correct. I don't know. But I've experienced this, and so do with it what you want. But I have, I have been in services where people came up for fibromyalgia for prayer or for arthritis for prayer, and we pray. And, and if, you know, if, you know, if you've been in Pentecostal, we cast out every demon known to, you know, we send them straight to the abyss. And we, we speak healing over them and all those things, and nothing happened. And this is something I learned from my pastor. And he, and he would say, uh, and since I've, I've taken it all on myself, he's, do you have any unforgiveness in your heart? And they would say, that's, of course, all of us, <laughs> if, we, we, if we really get serious, probably all of us have a little bit of unforgiveness in our heart. And, uh, and they would say yes, and he'd say, I want you just to, by faith, just say, I forgive that person. And they would, by faith, forgive that person, and immediately he, healing would come. Now, was it because Jesus didn't pay for it? No, Jesus paid for it. I don't know what it is about what's going on inside of us that blocks us from receiving the fullness, but I'm here to tell you today there is something that, and I'm not telling you got to get perfect to get, to get there, but what I'm telling you is in the process of growing and maturing, we have got to somehow align our thoughts. You know, Paul says, bring every thought captivity unto Christ. We somehow got to align our thoughts that every thought that we have, we, it is a training, it is a renewing of the mind. Every thought that we have begins to be aligned with Jesus. And when we face circumstances and encounter things that seem to uh, contradict the gospel we don't think our thoughts we begin to think as he thinks because we do have his mind right we do have his thoughts and his feelings and maybe my brain was wired in a way that i see everything in this black and white natural thing but we also know that that there is a supernatural kingdom that is here whether we see it or not whether we experience it or not that it is here and it supersedes this kingdom that we're in right now amen so here's what I, 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 let me say this. How do, we, how do we overcome unforgiveness? How do we overcome bitterness? How do we overcome these things? Well, the scripture says that God is love, right? So that means Jesus is love. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm the gate, I'm the door, right? So I honestly believe that love, this is why I love what Jeremiah preached. I actually preach love all the time. I was just picking on him. But I, I, I honestly, with all of my heart, I believe it is the door that floods us. I believe Jesus is the door that floods us with love that actually dissolves unforgiveness in our heart, that actually dissolves bitterness in our heart, that actually sets us free to love people that are unlovable, right? I, and, and here's what I had to do. This is how I share with you guys I, I struggle with insecurity. Uh, how I overcome insecurity was this right here. I did a series called Spiritual Warfare uh, in 2014. I just got back from... Uh, I just got back from a trip that I that I hadn't visited since my childhood, and uh, when I was at that trip, it brought up a lot of memories that I'd repressed for years, and uh, I was emotionally distraught, if you will. I was just struggling. I was laying up at bed with her about three o'clock in the morning, just saying, telling her all these things that was going on inside of me, and we're we're dry, we were actually in a little town called Rodosa, New Mexico. There's a racetrack there. My grandparents used to go work it every year. And we were going to, uh, where's, the, where's the alien place? Roswell. We're, my boys wanted to go see Roswell, and I wanted to go see where Billy the Kid was at. So we, we flipped a coin, and we went to Roswell. Uh, and on the way there, I'm driving, and I'm just kind of praying, and I'm, and I'm you know, processing everything that I was feeling. And I, and I went around the corner. I, I was praying, and I said, Lord, how do I, 
how do I deal with all this? And I was, I was like, just speak to me. And this is a true story. I drove around the corner, and there's this big sign in the middle of the desert that said, forgive. Big black and white sign. Nothing else. And I was like, here's your sign. And, and so, but the thing was, it's like, yes, it's easy to say forgive. Uh, and so I got back, and I started doing this, this series called Spiritual Warfare, but it's not like what you think. I, I was actually talking about overcoming shame, rejection, guilt, and security uh, so that we could be everything. It was the Army say, be all that you can be. Or is that the Marines? I don't know. But anyway, uh, so we could be all that we could be. And in that, the Lord began to reveal to me uh, the power of love, what it does to us, what it does in us, and what it does through us. And so I started doing this. I started meditating. And, and what I mean is, is I didn't... Uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't clear my mind out and all that stuff. I actually began to just close my eyes and think about, uh, about loving my wife and loving my kids. And, and I would actually generate that feeling inside of me that I would begin to feel the love that I have for them. And I actually turned that inward to myself. You know, Jesus says you got to love others as you love yourself, right? If you, you can't love anybody if you don't love yourself. And I didn't love myself, Right. And so I had to actually begin to generate. And then what I started doing was meditating that feeling on myself and thought, man, if this is how I feel about my kids, and God's never dealt with the things that I've dealt with because my love probably isn't as pure as what his love is, I began to meditate that that was how he felt about me, right? And in that, I began to, it wasn't like a, an instantaneous thing like my salvation was. It was like this process of letting God love on me, letting God flow through me. And in that process, I began to watch insecurities go away, forgiveness begin to manifest, uh, bitterness, offense. I was offended at my parents. I was offended at the church. I was just, I was just offended. Yeah, there's nothing better than being a pastor offended. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, uh, it's so. Let's move on here. I, I can stay on that for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go First Corinthians, ten, nine, and eleven. It says this. Uh, it says, this is Apostle Paul, he says, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things were happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages come. Uh, that really, I, I used to read past that and I didn't have a clue what it's saying. But the Lord revealed this to me. I, I'm slow, so it was like a year ago. Uh, the Lord began to just show me. He's like, hey, these things were written for your example. These things were written for you to learn from. And so I go back and read it. I go back to the original story. There's a, there's a you know, the rule of first appearance. I go back to the first appearance, what they're talking about. And, uh, and he's talking about as they were complaining, they drew snakes to themselves. And the snakes began to bite them. And the Lord began to minister to me that, that the things that's going on inside of you, you're complaining, you're negative, you're drawing to yourself the very things that you don't want, to, don't want in your life. You, you, you know, sometimes, uh, I'll, I'll say that my, my real mother was an alcoholic, drug addict, and everything you can, you can imagine. And I grew up angry at her and said, in my th mind, I was always saying, I will never be like her. Okay? But the thing was, I meditated on what I didn't want to be is what was deposited in my heart, and I actually became the very thing that I didn't want to be, right? So it, what goes on inside of here, whether it's, whether it's putting down, like, I don't uh, approve of that behavior, and I'm not saying there's not seasons or times for that. I'm talking about, like, in this situation with my mother uh, where I began to just continually say, I'll never be like her, I'll never be like her, I'll never be like her, until I meditated on that so much I became the very thing that I never wanted to be. This is why, it, it, I know this is a tough subject, but this is why most child molesters were molested at one time, and, and they were victims, and the shame and the guilt of what happened to them, they became angry, and in that anger, they talked about what they didn't want to become, or they never wanted wanted to and they became the very thing that they resented right this is why paul writes this hallelujah he says and this is philippians 4 8 he says finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there's any virtue if there's anything praiseworthy meditate on these things right 
I love the Christian church because if we talk about meditation, we, you know, because we got New Age movement, we don't want to meditate anymore. I mean, if, if, the, if the New Age movement starts worshiping, we're going to stop worshiping because we don't want to be, you know, like most of this stuff is hijacked from the church and it's time that we hijack it back. You know, you go outside of the United States, meditation is a big deal in Christian faith. And, and I'm talking about taking times of silence and, and actually focusing on things that are good, that are pure. I don't have to focus. Uh, what Sandra was talking about last night, that I don't want to be that way. i got to try harder. And the more that she tried and the more she focused on what she didn't want to be, developed in her, she became the thing that she didn't want to be. Right? And so instead of me focusing or meditating on it, because, see, we meditate all the time. Like, like you meditate when you drove here this morning, when you showed up here this morning, you're meditating on something. Uh, all I'm saying to you is let's just begin to meditate on things that are beneficial to us, right? And as we meditate on things that are beneficial, like, like I, there's, there's, there's uh, personality things about myself that I still don't like. But instead of me meditating on not being that anymore, I begin to meditate on Jesus and who he is. And somehow, I don't know how this thing works, but somehow what, who he is actually begins to become revealed into me. And I be, uh, effortlessly be, be the person that I want to be, right? The craziest thing about grace is, is, you know, true freedom from sin is when you can sin all you want, but you don't want to, right? And so here's what's happened. Jesus removed all the lines, and, and as the lines are removed, he says, either way, your salvation is secure in me because you believe in me, do what you want to do. And I'll be honest with you, some Christians, after they get, after they get a revelation of grace, they do go sin. They spend a season in sin. And then people say it's the message. It's not the message. If you don't have sin in your heart, you're not going to sin, right? You might have conformed to a religious idea for 20 years, and you got free from that, and you acted on what was already in your heart. But what grace will do, and, and, and you, you may be going a season of sin, then you realize, as Jeremiah was saying, it's not about going to heaven anymore. It's about you know, not wanting to be an idiot anymore, right? Not wanting to bash your thumb anymore. God's issue with sin from the beginning of time was not because he was getting mad at you. If you sinned, God's issue from the beginning of time was because he loved his children, and sin rapes and pillages his kids, right? So somehow in that, like, like when we're told not to do it, we want to do it, right? But somehow in the grace when he says, when the Father says, it's a finished work, I've dealt with all that, I've removed the law, now, now it's just the law of love. Uh, I, I'm going to love you no matter what, no matter what your behavior is. I'm going to put my righteousness on you and I'm going to love you. Somehow in that, in that process, we are transformed, right? Somehow in that process, we get to a, a place that we just don't want to do it no more, right? We want the fullness that God has for us, right? And we should not be offended by that. And what I mean is this. If God wants to bless you with a million dollars, let's not get spiritual about it. Put it in your bank account, right? And if you have a problem, you can. I, if some people don't believe in the tithe. That's okay if you don't believe in it, but you can still write 10% to my ministry. I'll be okay with it, right? We, we are to be a blessing. To, we, we are to be blessed to be a blessing, right? Hey, let me say this real quick. When, I, when, when, we talk, when I talk about prosperity, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about peace and joy. There's no greater commodity in this world, especially in the times we're living right now, than peace, right? I, and there's something about being in Jesus that brings you peace in the middle of it. So I got, I got ahead of myself a little bit. So what you speak creates the worlds around you. Right? If you're continually negative, you're going to always draw negativity to you. If you're continually uh, gossiping, you're going to draw gossipers to you. If you're continually pessimistic, pessimism is always going to be drawn to you. So what do we do? Well, Paul says if you change your, the way you think, if you renew your mind, he says you'll be transformed, you'll be changed. Go back to what Jesus said. He said this. He said, what you say, what you say, what you say, if you believe and you do not doubt, right? Believe and do not doubt. I think James, I might, I might butcher it. He says something like, if, if you ask something from the Lord and you doubt, he says, don't expect to get anything from the Lord. He didn't say you wouldn't get it. He just says, or don't, he says, don't expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's, he didn't say you wouldn't get it. He says, you're not going to receive it. So a lot of times when we think doubt is this, is like uh, these thought, you know, like Sarah, when the Lord said you're going to have a baby, she laughs at the Lord, right? But she's, but she did it anyway. She went forward with the plan. Uh, she gets, God doesn't, the final recording of Sarah isn't that she laughed at God when he said she was going to have a baby at 90 years old. The final recording in Hebrews 11 of Sarah was that she was a woman of faith, right? But 
But to understand why a lot of times that we don't receive the fullness that God has for us, because Jesus says, do not doubt. James says, do not doubt. The word doubt is rooted. That if you break down the root word of doubt, it's condemnation. And, as you, and, and so what is, what is condemnation? It's this expectation of punishment, right? Now, here's, the, here's, the, here's how we tell if we got condemnation in our heart, because all of us here are grace people. I'm never going to get punished. I'm, I'm going to get blessed. But what happens when somebody does you wrong? Because that's the litmus test. Because if your thought is, is they should be punished, you got condemnation in your heart, and it's blocking you from receiving the fullness that God has for you. I, I, did a, I did a sermon in the middle of all the race riots, or whatever you want to call them, and uh, I, I, I actually had my daughter-in-law make me a graphic, and it had a... Uh, the police on one side and the, and the protesters on the other side, and it says, wh- whose side are you on? And uh, I, this, this is, I'll just summarize it to you real quick. I said, I- I'm on Jesus' side, so where's he at? Because I, what, what started this or sparked this in me was people saying, I saw somebody with a picture, the, the same picture, almost the same identical picture, but they said, whose side do you think Jesus is on? And, of course, they were for the protesters, and they were said Jesus on the protesters' side. I, I go further than that. I think Jesus was sitting in the jail with Derek Chauvin, the guy that did the, the murder, because that's who Jesus is. Oh, the gospel's offensive. I think Jesus is on all sides, including the one that was found guilty and hated by America, right? See, if we thought... That cop needs to be punished. We probably we got condemnation in our heart. We have an expectation of punishment. Now I'm not saying now some people misinterpret me saying I don't believe in the legal system. I think we need a legal system. But what I'm saying as Christians, our heart should be for forgiveness, prayer, and love. Doesn't mean that we accept the 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 behavior, but we also have to realize that there's a person there, and whatever happened that day to that cop that caused him to do what he did, I, I'm sure it stems back to something. Right? He wasn't born that way. And so somewhere we need to look in deeper past the, 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 the flesh, if you will, to, in, to something inside his heart that caused him to go that day. Right? And we need to love him. Right? And we need to pray for him. And we need to pray for the fam. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not excluding everybody else. I think everybody else knows that we've got people that are Blues Lives Matter. We've got people that are uh, Black Lives Matter. I, I, I say we pray for all of them. Right? Amen. My son's a cop. And, and my son's 25 years old, and this is the first time in his life he's experienced something like this. And what I've watched happen to my son by all the social media stuff is I've watched him become bitter because all cops are bad. Uh, actually, I won't say it. But <laughs> uh, I've watched my son, 25 years old, and I'm, I'm saying to him, son, this, this, not everybody feels that way. Not everybody thinks that way. You can't let bitterness get in your heart, right? I said, son, we got to love Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter. we got to love the cop that was guilty. What blocks us from receiving? Doubt. What's doubt rooted in? Condemnation, right? How do we overcome condemnation? How do we overcome unforgiveness? How do we receive everything the Father has for us? How do we speak out of the abundance of our heart things that are true? How do we do it? We meditate on the love of God. Things that are true, things that are lovely, things that are just right? And if you don't know what that looks like, look at Jesus, right? Look at Jesus. He is the, he is the uh, God manifested in the flesh. You want to know how God deals with things? How does God deal with sinners? He sits down and has lunch with them. How, do, how does God deal with storms? Uh, he, calls, he doesn't say go over there and tear down that nation so that uh, they, they will repent and come to me. That's not how God deals with storms. God ceases storms. How does God deal with sick people? He heals them all. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Okay. I better get back to my notes. Hallelujah. Or we'll be here for a while. Uh, I just want to throw a couple scriptures out real quick about what we speak. Proverbs 13.3 says this. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Job, my favorite, one of my favorite, I always say my favorite when I'm reading them, and then, I, then I'll read the next one. I go, that's my favorite. <laughs> Job 22, 28 says this, you will declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. 
the Lord's been doing this thing in me lately where he's been, you, you probably probably heard it like the, the, there's the promise, then there's the process. Like God makes the promise and we go through this process before we get the promotion. You guys familiar with that type of thing? Like, like uh, uh, who is the dude? Joseph, right? He got the promise, spends 14 years in and out of jail, hallelujah, uh, and before the promotion manifested. And so, uh, when he says you will declare a thing and it will be established for you so the light will shine on your way, what are we declaring, right? And the thing is, is sometimes we declare things uh, out of our mouths and then we don't see instant gratification out of it because we live in the microwave society where we want everything right now and we give up on the promise that God gave us. We give up. It, says, it doesn't say that you, you says you'll declare a thing and it will be established and light will shine on your way. That You'll declare a thing and God will begin to show you the way of the thing that you declared. And sometimes it takes years. And most of the time it's up to us. It's not like God sitting back saying, ah, I'm going to wait another year. Sometimes we're just not ready for it, right? And, so, and sometimes when we're going through hard times, I've watched this through church. I've watched people come in, and I've watched their marriage falling apart. I've watched our finances falling apart. I've watched their kids uh, falling apart. And they come into church, and God begins to restore their marriage. They begin to restore their finances. I see their kids' lives being changed. Everything's, everything's awesome. And then as soon as they hit a hard season, hallelujah, they just stop. And they stop coming. And it, I know people, I know there's a big movement going on today. We don't need the church. I'm, I'm here to tell you we need the church, right? I, we were, we've been shut down. We were shut down for six weeks, and I had to get saved again when we opened back up. And we were shut down two weeks, two, two more weeks, just this last month. And when I, I'm glad I came. I was about ready. I was on the verge again. I didn't need to get saved again. But honestly, I need. I need church. I need worship. I need to be around people that are like-minded like me. I need it. And some reason, for some reason, when we go through hard times, we want to uh, evacuate ship. Uh, and we, we, you know, when we still say things like, yeah, I believe in God. I just, you know, it's just not working for me. Jesus asked you know, his disciples, uh, are you going to leave me too? And Peter had the best answer. He says, where, where else would we go? Right? Like I'm telling you. If you feel like you're going through hell with Jesus, I've been through hell without Jesus. Uh, and it's a lot better going through hell with Jesus. But here's the thing is in that process, God renews us and changes and strengthens us, right? Like I, I, can, encounter, I can encounter things now that two years ago that if I encountered the same thing, it would it'd just tear me up. Right now, I, I'm probably, I used to not, but you know, people say, I don't care what people think about me. And I used to think, you're lying. Everybody cares what people think about them. But I'm actually, at a, like, really, I don't really care anymore, right? I, I used to need validation from people. I Honestly, if, if people did not validate me, uh, I would try to find out what's wrong with myself and fix myself so that everybody would like me. Then I realized that not everybody's going to like me, right? I don't know what's wrong with them, but not everybody's going to like me. Hallelujah. And I'm okay with it. Why? Because whatever God was, the work that God's doing inside of me, uh, the work that God's doing inside of me transformed me and it changed me, right? I began to meditate on things differently. And I still catch myself. I run a construction business, so I, I don't get to sit. I, I'm dealing with worldly people all the time, right? And it's always, and, and my, what I do in, my, in the business right now is I negotiate contracts. I'm always dealing with customers. God bless them. Sometimes I want to hang them. But uh, <laughs> if the, nobody in here is going to call me for a job now. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But sometimes I catch myself getting negative, right? I catch myself going, man, why did I? Should, I there's a job that I'm, I, I can't say anything. But there, there's a job that I'm doing that I've, I've, I've came home for like a month going, I wish I'd never taken this job. I wish I'd never taken And I find myself getting negative. And what do I do? I, everybody around me is picking up on this negativity. And I change the atmosphere around me. See, I don't think that we realize the power of influence that we have. And, and, it, and it changes in my office. It changes around my foreman. It changes with my wife. Why? Because I've let something come inside of me. And what's inside of me is men, it's creating the world around me. Right? Do we want to receive everything God has? We, we, I do. I don't know about you. If Jesus paid for it, if it's paid in full, I don't, want to, I don't want to show up in heaven and Jesus say, yeah, this is all you left in your bank account. And it's like, oh. I want to grab a hold of it. I want to receive it. If he says that what I say, what I say, what I say, I can have, I want it. All of it. And I'm not offended by any of it. I want all of it. 
It, but, it's, it, but there is a process of getting there, and it, and it is renewing my heart, changing the way I think, and letting that world inside of me reflect the world. Like I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places right now. Like I'm not trying to get to heaven. I am there. I have arrived. And it's a letting the world that I'm actually a part of, a citizen of, uh, the, uh, uh, let that world shine out of me. And I'll actually draw to me people, influencers, people of, uh, like he was talking about, the mayor going up. So used to, I would never do that. I would sit down with her and say, yeah, that's, that's the mayor over there. Like, and we live in a town of 2,500, so we know that it's like, oh, there's a mayor. No, no. But I, we went to Bethel once at a church service, and Bill Johnson, I don't know if you guys are familiar. I used to really follow Bill Johnson a lot, and uh, I, I still love their stuff. Their book by Danny Silk called Culture of Honor, if you haven't read it, it helped me. Uh, understand leadership in a finished work church better than anything I've ever done any book I've ever read before but we're sitting there and Bill Johnson if you've never been there before he just he just stands up front if you've been to mega churches most of the time they stand in the back and then when after the worship they come out on the stage and they go back to the back Bill Johnson stands up front in the church just like we are right here and you can just go up and talk to him and Angela's like you should go talk to him I'm like oh I know I ain't going up and talking to him and she ends up pushing me to go up and so I, you know Oh, hey, uh, did I bump into you? Hey, uh, yeah. I went and met him, but that wasn't who I was, right? I was nervous, and I said, hey, I pastor a small church, and I started, and he talked to me, and he, he like a normal person. But me, I had him up on his pedestal, right? If, if, the world, if the world inside of me is negative, I draw people to my, I'm not saying, I know that we need to minister to people, that's not what I'm saying, but we draw the negative to ourselves, we draw the negative people. if I'm a gossiper, I'm going to draw gossipers to myself, if I can let that love, joy, and peace become the world inside of me, it will actually create an atmosphere around me that will draw to myself the people that God can use to propel me, right, move me to the next place, uh, it, God uses people to take us, to promote us, right, and the most of the time, he's going to use somebody <laughs> that you don't want him to use, right? <laughs> like, like sometimes, you, I bet when we were in prophetic circles, and people would get, it would always be the person that I didn't like that had the word for me, right? And they're starting to pray over me, and I'm sitting there thinking, come on, man, not you. And they speak right into my life, and I'm just, you know, how did you know that? <laughs> right? But we got to come to a place of like, I, I'll receive from anyone. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, let me throw. Let me read this scripture. Uh, do you might know what time it is? Am I doing good? Okay. Oh, praise the Lord! I always tell everybody at the church we have an amen quota. You know, if we don't hit a hundred, we're staying. And then I can cough, and people are going, "Amen." Uh, here we go. Habakkuk two, chapter two, verses two through three. Habakkuk says this, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may that he may run who reads it for the vision is yet an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. I didn't, I, I've never found this quote, but I heard a preacher preaching one time and he talked about Roy Disney at Walt Disney's funeral, his brother on Disney. And w what the gentleman had said was, is that Roy was sitting there and one of the guys that helped do it, uh, or no, sorry, it wasn't at the funeral. It was at the grand opening of Walt Disney. I guess Walt didn't get to see the grand opening of Walt Disney. And they were sitting at the ribbon cutting and a gentleman said to Roy, he says, wouldn't it be awesome if Walt could have seen this? And Roy says, Walt seen this or you wouldn't be seeing it, right? See, what are we seeing in our spiritual mind that's like, he says write it down. Why do we want to write it down? So we can see it, so we know it, so we can keep our goals in line. Like I, I, we, did a, we did a fishing, or a fishing, we did a uh, uh, vision board at our church. And I've never done this stuff before. It, it, I know it's hokey pokey stuff, but it, the thing is, uh, Almost every person that put uh, stuff on their vision board, I've had them come to me and say, man, I've had 80% of that vision board come to complete. They hung it in their bathrooms. They hung it in their bedrooms. I literally put the biggest fish I could find on my vision board, and this is a true story. Christmas of last year on Jesus' birthday, I caught a 47-pound catfish, right? My vision came to fruition, right? So this year, I'm going to put a bigger fish on there because I'm ready. Uh, I took a dollar bill and wrote a million on it, you know, put a check in my pocket. 
But if we, here's, here's to summarize everything that I'm saying, is I believe that the promise is true. And I think that some of us get frustrated because we find ourselves in situations in our finances, in our health, in our families, where it feels like this is the promise from God, but I'm not experiencing it. And, and the thing is, I think sometimes we focus so much on the promise, we actually miss. I, I, hold that thought, because I've got I to lead up to this. There's a, there's a, there, right, out, right before the parable of the sower, there's a parable where it talks about a farmer who plants seed in the soil and he says that even while he sleeps and even while he's awake the seed produces a harvest right and he doesn't even know how it works well so we know that the seed 